Well, good afternoon, everybody. Happy Sabbath. It is good to see this room full. Um, how are you guys feeling today? Good. Everybody doing okay? Good, good. Well, uh, I want to start by asking you guys a question. And I am going to do something today that in the two and a half years we've been here, I've never done. I am going to use this. So I've got a question for you, and I want you to be thinking about this. What are, in your mind, the attributes of Christ? Now, don't answer. I want you to be thinking about this. And I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to leave that there and just let you think about it for a little while. But I want you guys to think about the attributes of Christ as Christ has revealed himself to you, uh, as you have read and learned about who Christ is. Think of the things that Christ means to you. And, and while you're doing that, I want you to turn over to um, Romans 13. And we're going to bounce around a lot today. Uh, my, my prayer today is that we spend more time reading God's Word than we spend listening to mine. Uh, in fact, you know what? Let's, let's pray that right now. Uh, if you could bow your heads, let's, let's pray before we get started. Father in heaven, most gracious God, as we just sang, Lord, I, I need you right now, not to, to not to allow, allow me to speak my words, uh, but Father, to speak your words, uh, that this message would just be a blessing, Lord, uh, that every word that comes out of my mouth would be edification to the body, uh, that uh, you would just fill this room with your Holy Spirit, that your presence would be here among us, that you would teach us, every one of us, me included, from your word today. Father, I pray this in the holy name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so I am going to spend a lot of time reading Scripture today. So, so that you don't tear up your Bibles flipping back and forth, I've prepared a couple of slides for us, and you can just read along with us as long as this works. Uh, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time because my formatting uh, it is very small. It's even smaller than I thought it was. That's... Uh, you might want to get out your Bibles. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, so, well, it doesn't matter. Um, we'll read in Romans 13, and we're going to start in verse 8. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And that's really, really interesting, right? Uh, when, you, when you sit and you think about love, and you think about the law. Uh, you know, I've had a couple conversations with folks here recently about the law, and you know, why why do I follow the law that's that's written out in the Old Testament? And this week, uh, for for whatever reason, God God led me to Psalm 119, and He just kind of parked me there for a little while, and I read the entirety of Psalm 119. And if you have not done that, just sit down, start to finish and read it. And in fact, he, he, he pressed me even further to write every single word of Psalm 119, all 170 plus verses. And, and it is so full of love for God, for his statutes, for his law, for his precepts, for his commandments, for his testimonies. There's so much love that the psalmist has for God when he's in pain, when he's persecuted, when he's rejoicing. It, it's so much love. And, and, and thinking through that, I, I've shared with you guys before, uh, growing up, uh, kind of my, my, my view of God. Uh, and, and it was a very twisted view of God. Because I, I grew up in a, a family and in a faith where the law was very important. We were keeping the Sabbath, every Sabbath. 
We were keeping the Ten Commandments. We were following the dietary laws. We were in our, our seats on the holy days. The law was very, very, very important. It was everything that we did. In fact, that was my identity in God, was the law. But that identity was twisted because it wasn't a law of, I love God, so I'm keeping these things. My identity was, God doesn't want me to do these things or he'll smite me, so I got to keep doing these, and these are the things that I'm supposed to do, so I'm going to do them anyway, you know? That was, that was how I, I loved the law. It was a love, almost, almost like a fire insurance, right? I'm going to keep the law because if I don't, then God's, I'm not going to make it in the kingdom, right? But this seems to paint a, a much different story, a, a much different picture of the law here, right? Uh, reading again in, in uh, uh, let's see, chapter, or verse 8, Owe no, no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. And skipping to verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. You see, the law, the law wasn't wasn't created so that we would only follow the letter of the law. As the psalmist found, the law was created so that we could learn about God, that we could fall in love with God, that we could grow deeper in our understanding of Him so that we would want to chase after Him. The psalmist says that, that he, he, uh, his mouth is, is parched. He, he longs, he desires for more of God's Word and His testimonies and His precepts and His statutes. And there's a love that he has for God. And this love that we're reading about here in Romans is the same thing. You shall not commit adultery. Why? Anybody. If we're thinking about it in terms of love, why wouldn't you want to commit adultery? It's harmful to your spouse. Absolutely. It's not showing love to your spouse, right? Jesus says, you've heard it said, don't, don't commit adultery. I say, don't even lust after a woman, or you've already committed adultery in her heart. There was so much more to it. There was such a pure, deeply rooted love in that commandment. Not murdering. What does he say to do instead of murdering? To love, right? Don't even hate your brother, but to, to, to love those, even those who, who hate you, who spitefully abuse you, to, to pray for them to love them. You shall not steal. Instead, those who have stolen, stop stealing. Go out and work so you can make money so that you can then provide for others. Don't bear false witness, but be a testimony to the truth. There is so much love deeply rooted in the law of God. And if you guys can squint, we're going to look at another one. Matthew 5. And since I can't read that, I'm going to turn over. You can, uh, you can just look up on the screen. Matthew 5, the, the law as it, as it stands, we had an image of what the law was supposed to look like, right? We just sang about him. He came, he lived a perfect life, he died a perfect death on the cross so that we could have our sins washed clean. And chapter 5, starting in verse 17 do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law until it is all fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of these commandments and teaches men to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does these and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I've also heard it said that when Christ died on the cross, he did away with the law, right? Uh, and, and that we no longer have to keep the law, we no longer have to walk in the law. But Jesus here, his own words, it's in red there because he said it. He didn't come to do away with the law. He didn't come to get rid of it. He came to fulfill the law. And what is the fulfillment of the law? Love. Love. It's love. You guys, we need to do some jumping jacks or something. All right. 
So Jesus didn't come to, to do away with the law. He came to fulfill the law. He came to be love, to show us the manifestation of what the law was. Moving on, uh, Matthew 7, uh, another perfect illustration of this love, right? Uh, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, also do to them, for this is the law and the prophets. We've heard this referred to as the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Why is this a fulfillment? Why is this the law and the prophets? Do we love ourselves? We absolutely love ourselves. And if we treat ourselves kindly, we, 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 we buy things for ourselves, we don't steal from ourselves, we don't commit adultery against ourselves, we don't murder ourselves, then we need to be doing that to others as well. Matthew 22, turning over a couple of chapters, Matthew 22 and starting in verse 37, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On the two commandments, on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. To love with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. That's how we're supposed to love God the Father. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is what the law means. The law is not a law of, of rules so that we can follow to the letter. And, and we, as, as human beings, we, we, we fall into this trap of having, we have an objective, right? This is what you have to do. If you want to lose weight, eat these foods, do these exercises. If you want to make money, uh, get this job, invest in these stocks. If you, you don't want to, you want to get married, brush your teeth, comb your hair, you know, the, the things that you have to do, right? And, and we follow these things to the letter, thinking that this is what's going to get us where we, we, we need to be, where we want to be. That's going to reach our objectives. And so often we can see the law if we dive too deep into following the letter of the law. Not that following the letter of the law is wrong, but following the letter of the law alone misses the entirety of the purpose. It misses the whole point. Because the point of the law is love. And if, if I'm not killing anybody, but I hate a guy, have I fulfilled the law? No, I've broken the law in my heart. And, and what is God concerned about when it comes to us? Our heart. Thank you. Yes, it's our heart. Whoops. Uh, so we'll move on to the next scripture. Uh, John, <laughs> uh, don't trust me with a remote. John 13, or to prepare slides, apparently. Uh, John 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give to you. Jesus speaking here again. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you also have love one for another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And what does it say? There is no greater love than what? Than to lay down one's life for his friends, right? And, and, and Jesus is saying, love each other as I have loved you. And, and he, he follows that up in John 14 by saying, if you love me, speaking to himself, if you love Jesus, keep his commandments. And his commandments are love. Galatians 5. And I know I'm bouncing around a lot here, but uh, you guys don't have to. Galatians 5, and starting in verse 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, only not to use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, But through love, serve one another. For all law is fulfilled in one word, even this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Oftentimes, we hear there's a juxtaposition between law and grace. They are opposites of each other. That's what that word means. I learned it. 
Love is, is the binding element between law and grace. Love, that's it. Jesus Christ came and he lived the law perfectly. But he also had grace on all of those whom he spoke with, even those whom he corrected. He corrected in grace. And that grace was out of the love that he had, so much so that he, he, he loved us so much that he gave his life for us while we were still sinners. 1 Timothy 1 1 Timothy 1 and starting in verse 5. Now the purpose of the commandment, speaking of the the commandments of old, the, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith, from which some, having strained, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things that they affirm. The purpose of the commandment, the purpose of what I grew up knowing, the purpose of what we have all come to uh, uh, some level of understanding, whether great or small, every one of us, as we learn more, as we grow closer to God, the purpose of, of His commandment is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and from sincere faith. May we never be teachers of the law, but don't understand that the whole purpose of it is love. James 2. James 2, and uh, starting in verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law, backing up a little bit, he's talking about... uh, He's talking about giving preference to, to, to someone who's great rather than someone who's poor. And we can see this playing out in society, right? Uh, we, we make idols of people who are, are famous, who have a lot of money. You know, if uh, uh, you're a basketball fan and LeBron James came in the room, you would, you would probably sit him in the front of the room. You, you'd give him the best treatment. I don't know who. Uh, pick somebody if you're not a LeBron fan. It's just the first name that came to mind. Uh, <laughs> Michael Jordan. Can anybody hate Michael Jordan? All right. Michael Jordan comes into the room. (laughs) You're probably going to set him up on a pedestal, right? Now, somebody who doesn't play basketball, somebody who's poor in the talent of basketball, you're probably going to be like, what are you doing? Get out of here, right? Me. You're going to put me in the back of the room. I can't dribble to save my life, right? Not a great analogy, but he's saying... In verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The fulfillment of the law is to have love. Going back to Romans 13. And I don't think I said this, but this is kind of going to be our our base camp for for this message. Going back to to Romans 13 and and reading again in verse 8, Owe no one anything except love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For what commandments you shall not, for the commandments you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, they are summed up in saying this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Christ 
didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill the law. The fulfillment of the law is love. Christ being the fulfillment of the law, Christ is love. That's who Christ is. Christ was the word at the very beginning. Now, we're going to continue to read here in Romans 13, uh, moving on to uh, verse 11. And do this, knowing the time, that now is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. We see that love is the fulfillment of the law. Why are we doing it? We've just had two, I, I got to say, two amazing messages the last two weekends. Last weekend, William talking about the, the disciple being disciplined. Justin talking about uh, when, you're, when you're waiting, don't, don't wait idly, but, but wait in preparation. And there were other things that both of them said, but that's what I got out of them. <laughs> and do this knowing the time. Knowing the time that now is high time to wake up. Guys, it is time for us as a body to wake up. And that's not to say that I'm pointing a finger at anybody else. I'm pointing a finger at myself just as much as anybody. But this time that we are living in is evil. The things that are in the news every single day are evil. The things that we are surrounded with are evil continually, all day long. And it is time for us to wake up out of our sleep, to love as the fulfillment of the law. Mark 13 Mark 13 and verse 12. Nope. Mark 13, verse 32. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and each to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what uh, what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Guys, I don't know when Jesus Christ is coming back. Nobody does. But he's coming back. And we know that this world is getting more and more and more evil, which doesn't mean that we need to be taking a stance against it in in that we can do anything to prevent it. What that means is that we need to be preparing the ground of our hearts in love, following his commandments in love, waking up, watching, paying attention, praying, seeking the Lord, Alive, awake in His Word. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and uh, verse 34. Backing up to verse 33. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. 
Oh, man, that punches me right in the gut. Some of us don't have the knowledge of God. This word is written to us, to all of us. If that doesn't make us want to wake up, I don't know what will. That terrifies me. That, that some of us don't have the knowledge of God. We, we profess to know God. We, we profess, we, we even go out and teach. But we don't know Him. We don't have the love of Him overflowing out of our lives into every facet. But just as Kristen said earlier, shame is a tool of the devil. Shame can be a very useful tool, but if we get stuck in that shame, we can get buried by it, right? Satan can just keep on, this is a shovel, he's uh, keep on putting dirt on top, that didn't look like a shovel. He can just keep on burying us, keep on causing us to be separated. But we need to be waking up. Don't let shame run away with our, our relationship with God, but in love, fulfilling the commandments, drawing nearer to God in every opportunity. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, and, and, and starting in verse 8. For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is, all, is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is, that acceptable, or what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things that are done by them in secret, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. There are a lot of things right now that are very shameful for us to even talk about that are being done openly in this world. Things that people are taking pride in that go 100% against God, and they're flaunting it. What should be shameful, this world parades around as a thing to be proud of. And if we can't see that in our daily lives, then, then this admonition is to, to us. Oh, awake you who sleep. If you don't turn on the news... And are, are just, the, the psalmist says that, that my rivers flow from my eyes because man has just run away from your law. It's all around us. And, and, and us, we, we all walked in darkness and praise God that he brought us into the light. That we are now his children adopted into his family. But if the fruits of our life are not walking in life, light, then maybe we are those who sleep. 1 Thessalonians 5. Verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. For those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or we sleep, we should live together with Him. It's so easy to get wrapped up in the things of this world. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. 
It's all around us. It's on billboards. It's on TV. It's on social media. It's in the newspapers. It's all around us. You need to work hard to be rich. You need to spend this money on this car, this house, this whatever. Look at this girl. Isn't she attractive? Look at this guy. Wouldn't you like to be married to him? It's all around us. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Let us not sleep as others do. First Corinthians. First Corinthians six. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We have such an amazing hope in salvation. We have forgiveness of our sins. We, we were some of these folks. We walked as the world walked. And praise God that by His great abundant mercy, He opened our eyes to see the error of our ways, to come to repentance. That, that mere fact that we have the ability to come to repentance it is such an enormous gift from our Creator. And we were washed we were sanctified. We were set apart. He chose us and set us apart from the world. Let us be apart from the world. There's another scripture that, that lists out another, another big long list of sins and the people who practice them. And it also says, and, and those who support, those who, 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 who don't stand against them are counted just as them. If, if we take on this, this mantra of acceptance that the world is cramming down our throats, then we are just as guilty as the sinners. If we stand up for somebody because that's just who they are, they're just living their best life, they're just doing them, is that what God wants us to do? Is that showing love to that person? Let me ask you another question. Is that what Jesus would have done? When Jesus caught, the, the woman that was caught in adultery was brought to Jesus, what did he say? You're okay. It's just who you are. Don't worry about it. Keep on going. No. What did he say? Go and sin no more. This is not to say that we're to be rude, that we're to be hateful, that we're to be watching around with, or walking around with, with pitchforks and, you know, jumping on parades for, for hate. That's not it. But the fulfillment of the commandment is love. And sometimes the most loving thing that we can do is to encourage someone to go and sin no more. Second Corinthians, just flipping over a, a couple of chapters, Second uh, Corinthians 10. Verse three: "For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds 
for casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I'm going to submit to you guys the, the spiritual warfare that is going on right now is raging. It is alive and it is pressing forward. You see, the thing is, Satan knows all of this too. Satan knows that no man knows the day or the hour. Satan doesn't know the day or the hour. Not even the angels in heaven. The Father alone knows the day and hour when Christ is going to return. But he knows we're drawing closer. Just as we know that that day is closer than when we first believed, Satan also knows that that day is closer than when we first believed. And this spiritual warfare is so strong right now. I have talked with so many people who are being faced with, with doubt, with fear, with anxiety. And think about it. That's not, that's not natural. Our, our human body doesn't naturally bring that on. That's, that's something that the Spirit rages against us. There is a warfare going on right now in our lives raging, and our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for pulling down those strongholds, for pulling down anxiety, fear, doubt, for standing against the sin of this world as they try to push it on us. I, I'm going to take a guess that there's going to come a day when, when a guy can't stand up here and say, fill in the blank is sin. Legally, I can't say homosexuality is a sin, drunkenness is a sin, adultery is a sin, because to say that goes against the law that man has established. And where do you think that is coming from? The spiritual warfare that is being waged is so alive and well, not well, well, it's well, it's raging. Philippians 4. Philippians 4 and verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue... If there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. We need to be awake. We need to be watchful. That doesn't mean that we need to be scared. That doesn't need, mean that we need to be sticking our heads in the sand. Just as Justin spoke about, we need to be actively working Knowing that that time is coming, as William spoke about last week, having a discipline as God's disciple to meditate on whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, instead of filling our minds with the things of this world, the drunkenness, the revelries, the homosexuality, the transgenderism, the, the sins that this world is parading in front of us, where should our mind be focused? On the things of God. And these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Finally, I want to go to Galatians 5. Finally does not mean conclusion, but a final scripture. Galatians 5, starting in verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, 
and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as you also, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those things are so rampant in this world. And it's so easy for us to get, I mean, look at that list. That's a long list of sins. And it's very easy, as enticing as the world makes all of these sins sound, it's very easy to get wrapped up in some of those. But guess what? We have an accuser, and that accuser wants to see us get wrapped in those sins so that he can stand before God and say, hey, look, look what Adam did. Look, look, see, see, see. He's not one of yours. He's a sinner. We also know that people who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Can anybody give me one thing that would be wrong in demonstrating any one of these? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such. Well, I, that, that's the spoiler. Anybody? Anybody have anything that stands against those? Nope. You can't. Because it says right here, there is no law that stands against that. No law of God that stands against that. I'm going to guess there's a law of man that's coming. But there is no law of God. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Turn back, if you are in your Bible, turn back to Romans 13. That's a long list of stuff. It's a lot of scriptures we just went through. Amen. Amen. And uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of meat there that we didn't even begin to get into. But reading again Romans 13 and verse 11, and do this knowing the time, that now is high time to awake out of sleep for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. Guys, we're in the night right now. This is an age of darkness. This is the night. And the night is far spent. The night started when sin was introduced into this world. And the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. All of those things that we just, put off, uh, we just read through, every single one of them, put them off. And let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness, not in uh, lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. I've had a couple conversations with people recently who have questioned whether or not they were saved. We just read the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We just read the things that we're supposed to be meditating on. We look a couple verses back, the fulfillment of the law is love. 
And if I don't see those things manifesting in me, what if I'm not saved? And I think all too often when we we think of salvation, we kind of want it to be like one of those HGTV shows, right? We leave in the morning, we've got a messy house, we come back, it's completely renovated, it's a whole new thing, right? We walk in, the faucets are updated, the handles, they've got those soft closed drawers on the... That's not how it works, though. There's a lot of involvement from us. There are sins. There are sins that God frees us from. There are sins that He can absolutely provide deliverance from. But this is an action verse here. This is action that He's asking us to take. Put off... Cast off the works of darkness. But it doesn't stop there. It's not enough to just stop sinning. What do we have to do on top of that? We put on the works, the armor of light. More than that, verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I asked you guys earlier a question about attributes of Christ. And hopefully you've been thinking about that and not listening to my... Well, hopefully you've been listening to all of it. But, but I want to ask, uh, what are some of the attributes that you guys uh, think of when you think of Christ? Anybody? Yes, sir. Compassionate. Compassionate. Yes, sir. You're going to have to go slow, I write. Humility. Gracious, forgiveness. Strength. Did I hear strength? Yeah, strength. strength. Meekness. Meekness. Slow to anger. Selfless. Wise twice. I'm going to have to do that one. Merciful. Merciful. Joyous. Joyous. Obedient. Obedient. Just. Just. Disciplined. Thank you. That's enough for now. This is a big list, and this doesn't even scratch the surface. That's going to drive me nuts. This doesn't even scratch the surface, right? There, there are so many names that Jesus goes by in here. We could also add the corrector. We could add, uh, well, we've got disciplined, the discipliner. Uh, There are so many things that Jesus encompasses, but every single one of them, compassionate, is love, humility, love, graciousness, love, forgiveness, love, strength, just, disciplined, meek, slow to anger, selfless, wise, merciful, joyous, obedient, corrector. That's an awesome list of attributes. Every single one of those is under the banner of love because Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Now, thinking about our salvation in the instruction here, we are told to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And and, and what's something that you think of when you hear put on, right? I think of clothes, I, I think of my clothes. Uh, every morning I wake up and I, I put on clothes. Most mornings I wake up and I put on clothes. All mornings I wake up and put on clothes. But the clothes that I put on are a very good indicator of what my day is going to be like, right? If I wake up and I put on my cutoff denim jeans and a ratty t-shirt, probably going to be working in the yard, right? Probably going to be doing something that I don't want to get my, my clothes dirty. If I walk out, my cutoff pearl snap, 
It's probably picture day, right? <laughs> I bought, I, well, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. I, I put that on every, every single day I put on clothes. And this is a conscious choice that we have to make every single day. Daily, we have to make this choice to put on Christ. When we wake up in the morning, the physical clothes that we put on are indicative of what our day... Or the, you, anyway, that's what it's going to look like for the day. But the spiritual clothes that we put on are also indicative of what our day is. If we wake up in the morning and we say, today... I'm going to be compassionate. And a situation arises where compassion is necessary. How much more likely are you to be compassionate if you have put on compassion for that morning? If uh, you wake up and you say, I'm going to be joyous today. We used to have a guy that attended with us. His name was Eric, uh, another Eric. Uh, he walked in one morning uh, on a Sabbath, and I said, hey, Eric, how you doing? He said, I'm, I'm doing okay. I lost my job. <laughs> what? And he said, I, I, I woke up in the morning, and I said, God, today I'm going to be joyous. He walked into a pink slip. He said, okay, God, I, I chose to be joyous today. If he had not put on those clothes that morning, how much more devastating could that have been? If we cho choose to put on obedience, even when a difficult situation arises, if we're hanging out with our friends and they're doing something that we're not supposed to, if we're at the office and whatever it is, bad language, dirty jokes, whatever, we chose to be obedient in the morning, how much more obedient will we be? And I would, I would encourage us all. I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the sticky note challenge. Um, I'm going to issue everybody in here a, a challenge. When you get home tonight, get a sticky note, get lipstick and put it on your mirror, paste it on the ceiling, change it to your, your background on your phone, whatever the first thing you look at in the morning is, tomorrow morning, Tomorrow morning, I want you to wake up, and the first thing that you see is put on Christ. And fill in the blank. Whatever Christ means to you, wherever your weakness is, Christ can fill in that weakness. By putting on Christ, we are walking in love. If love is the fulfillment of the law, Christ fulfilled the law and we are supposed to put on Christ, what are we supposed to be putting on? Every day. Every day we are to be putting on love. And that's not the love of the world. We know in 2 John that it says, don't love the world. That's not that kind of love. This is a godly, a righteous love that we put on every single day, a conscious decision that we make for Christ every single day. Guys, this world, it is a scary time. And it's not going to get better. We may go through times where, and I, I pray that this happens, where there is revival in this nation. I pray that this nation is convicted of its sins that we will turn back to God, that we will as a nation, as a world, follow our Creator God. But even if that happens, it's only temporary because this Word is truth. And this Word tells us that it's going to get a lot worse, but then it's going to get so much better. I just, I am so excited about the kingdom when there won't be fear, there won't be pain, there won't be anxiety, there won't be shame. Every day, our nature 
will be Christ. Our nature will be love. That's what we will be changed into because that's what God is. And I am so excited to see every one of you there with me. I hope I'm there. I hope we're all there. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for your law, for your commandment. Lord, I just pray that you equip us every single day to put on your nature, Christ, to put on love, to fulfill the law every day. God, give us strength in times that we are weak. Give us everything that we need at the exact moment that we, ha- we need it. Your timing is perfect. Your deliverance is perfect. Your mercy is perfect. Lord, help us to resemble you. Help us to walk Jesus as you walked. Lord, we love you. We praise you. And we pray this all in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen.